Hey, hey, everybody, it's JB, and you're listening to another wrestling podcast. Uh, today's guest is, I, I don't know exactly how to say it. Quite honestly, I think th- this person's unlike anybody else we've had on the show so far. Um, we spoke with him brief- briefly recently, but I wanted to have him come back and have a full sit down with us. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Mr. Roman Roselle. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Awesome. No, I'm doing really good. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on today. Like I said, a very complex individual today, and uh, we've got a lot to kind of unpack here. So let's uh, let's get started. I I want to I know where I want to get us, but I want to kind of try to get there um, a, a different way. So um, if you could kind of give us what we call like the elevator pitch of who Roman Roselle is. So starting out you know when you from when you were born maybe where you were born and all that stuff just kind of briefly to where you are today like a quick pitch how do you round out roman roselle for us man well i guess to start off uh people never uh have heard of me or anything like that you know i'm a uh i'm a retired green beret husband father of six 35 year old college athlete at the arizona state university and uh, at the same time, you know, I'm taking the pro wrestling industry by storm. Uh, I just got did my WWE tryout in December. Uh, had a match not too long ago where uh, Dan Severin, he's been kind of like my mentor, my trainer, my manager. And partnered with Grunt Style, uh, the number one top elite clothing lifestyle brand out there. And uh, we're just taking over the pro wrestling sports entertainment uh seen as a man with force let's just say that but uh aside from that that's kind of like a quick snapshot of kind of like where we're at now but i'm originally from apache junction arizona and if you have never heard of apache junction arizona uh people kind of call it the armpit of arizona for (laughs) i guess for people that are familiar with that area (laughs) it's always funny when i come up to somebody that is from Arizona, and they're like, where are you from? They're like, Phoenix. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm from AJ, or Apache Junction. like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, that, no, that's that's where I'm from, man. I, uh, whew, where to begin, man? Uh, see, it was kind of a rough upbringing for me. You know, my parents kind of, they split up when I was six, and my, my, uh, my mom immediately got into, like, a toxic relationship that was just, you know, anything that comes along with that, you know, addiction, abuse, God, uh, took me all over the place. Honestly, by the time I was 13, I'd already went to nine schools. So it was just, you know, trailer park to trailer park to house. I mean, we squatted in just some weird places. I mean, we had stuff to where we would like hide in some trailer, live there for a month, no, no electricity or water. And, you know, (laughs) <laughs> basically use like kerosene lamps and I'm, I'm telling you man it's just like some weird stuff that you see uh like little house on the prairie stuff but i don't even know how i was able to get through school but that was the, that was the upbringing for me but um where pro wrestling is in the background of that whole situation is that you know most uh how do you say i guess with families that are have addicts in them they don't spend a lot of time with their kids you know they're looking for their next bump wherever they got to go and if they are home you know they're in that bedroom doing whatever and a lot of the times the kids are kind of just left isolated you know so there's summer days where you know you're out of school so you're there all day you don't have your family there you know there's just regular days there's holidays you don't have no gifts no nothing so you're just alone all the time so press pro wrestling for me literally from the time i could walk i mean it's in my baby book it says i've been watching pro wrestling since 17 months old and that was like my uh my escape you know it was always there it kind of helped me cope with a lot of things you know i was able to kind of resonate with a lot of the characters and you know mess around with my little pillows wrestle them around <laughs> and you know i got to be that character so like even though like the environment the scene where i was at was really bad i was kind of able to use man just larger than life characters you know it's, Hulk Hogan, the Ultimate Warrior, you know, Ric Flair, everybody, and kind of like me pretend to be them. Uh, going all the way up until, you know, 
even in you know my middle school days, you know, junior high, you know, that's when the NWO came out for me. So it was just, it's always been there for me. So we're we're not um, too far off in age. You're actually, I think, uh, one year, like one year younger than me, and obviously have accomplished much more. But um, it's funny no, because no. we're uh, we're kind of the same. I, you know, I had a different upbringing, but still one where my parents got divorced when I was young. And it's funny how professional wrestling or, you know, whatever you're into, if you're a fan of baseball or whatever, um, that it can kind of fill those gaps like you're talking. And I know that it was always something that was there for me, you know, like, um, you know, family could be fighting or, uh, you know, whatever was going on, had a rough day, but you could come home and turn that on. So I grew up in the 80s and, um, you know, we got to we kind of got to see that boom period. It was it was the Hulk Hogan, and then it went through the 90s where it was kind of gimmicky, and then boom, the Attitude Era like you're talking about. So um, you mentioned a few of the, the wrestlers, the Hulk Hogan, the Ric Flairs, the Ultimate Warriors, but even at a young age, do you remember kind of um, like figuring out who you liked uh, at, at a young age? Like did it change much? Like for me, for whatever reason, I was, a, I was just – like immediately um kind of more the heels like my favorite has always been ravishing rick <laughs> and i don't even know oh, why yeah, as, like a, as a as a young kid why i would have chose that but um what was it like <laughs> for you who did you who were some of your favorites oh man so literally my earliest childhood like you know i've seen therapists you know because i got ptsd traumatic brain injury all that other stuff but i always when they talk about memory because i have those issues i'm like my earliest childhood memory is literally going i had to have been four I just remember seeing, like, you know, the pink outfits, so the Heart Foundation versus, obviously, the Stripes, the Killer Bees, you know. So those are kind of things that stand out. I don't remember the the faces, all that, but the 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 gear stood out to me. So that's, like, my earliest memory. Next up, I had to have been maybe five, four or five, where I could kind of understand things. But it was Hulk Hogan. And it was Hulk Hogan specifically because it was one of the – this is when, a time when my parents were still together. And they gave me this gift – <laughs> that said rip him you know it was a uh, Hulk it was Hulk Hogan they said that he sent it to me so I believe that literally I believe that all the way up until I was like probably 12 yeah <laughs> they kind of kept that going it was like kind of believing in Santa Claus and then you kind of find out like what Hogan never sent that to me <laughs> but um yeah no Hulk god man he was just because of uh the the issues that I had obviously growing up I still listen to his like demandments you know say yeah. your prayers take your vitamins and listen to your parents and uh for whatever reason like i respect hulk everything he you know he was just huge he's all all american had the flag he just had that charisma so it was it was hogan all the way and then of course macho man macho man was great because he had the voice and he could just man turn it up he was really intense so it was it was those two and then the alternative was obviously like tbs you know wrestling and you know you had rick flair but more importantly, like Sting, Sting had the face paint, and obviously, like the product, the studio wrestling wasn't as like flamboyant and extravagant as like WWE. But those were basically like the four characters that I remember at a very early age, just kind of sticking with and like following all the way through. So, as you're until the '90s, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you're, you say you had this really tough upbringing, this this armpit of Arizona that you were living in and um <laughs> and then throughout your teenage years now did you um and did you do many sports growing up um did that help with so kind of actually no I, I didn't and it was because I mean when you're with a meth head mom and obviously like well, let me set the record straight my mom has been sober since 2003 we have a great relationship but at that that's at that time you know, moving place to place, I was never in one spot to play sports or parks and rec, any mm -hmm. of that other stuff. I did get to a couple times when we were close to my dad. And it's like, it wasn't like my dad was out of the picture. It's just my mom kind of took us all over the place. And it wasn't until we got taken away from my mom when I was 13, where we eventually got relocated and put uh, with my dad. And from there is where I was kind of stable. So I went to a junior high or middle school where I was able to kind of play sports. Cause I know it's different now, but at that time you didn't have to play or correction pay to play. 
so it was I was able to you know play football um wrestle and you know I was always that fat overweight kid with zits that people used to always make fun of because they knew where I came from but when I started playing sports you know I could hit the hardest and then for wrestling like for never wrestling ever before I I was beating kids that had been doing it for a long time you know I was winning like those city championships so that kind of like turned the tides for me so people started to kind of respect me a little bit rather than laugh at me and that kind of helped kind of formulate and carry, carry me into high school where I kind of took it serious and started putting more work uh, behind the scenes and knew what I needed to do to get out of that, that environment that I was in. Well, not a lot of people um, really, you kind of, you know, you gave a, a, the pitch about kind of your life, but this is some just remarkable stuff at, you know, you've reinvented yourself several times. You know, you grew up in a in a tough environment, and you you didn't let that get you down. Um, you joined the the military. You were a Green Beret, which obviously is just insane um, on, on that level. <laughs> and then, not only that, but you had a lot of you know very trying times when you were in the army, and then you come back and then you decide to go back to school. So what was the, I mean, like how was the readjusting process whenever you came back from that and um, what made you decide to go back to school? Man, so it was, it was definitely kind of tough because in, uh, in the military I was making a lot of money, but I've, you know, I had, uh, I've been blown up one too many times, just like everyone else. Um, I actually had to have a waiver to go to, uh, to selection, you know, when I was trying out for the special forces, just because I had the brain injury and then with t- PTSD, just not getting it worked out. Uh, anyways, all that stuff kind of like catches up to you and, you know, it's just kind of hard to live with and deal with. Um, so then when it was kind of time for me to, you know, cut the cord and, you know, start a new chapter in my life, it was kind of tough because, you know, I got six kids and, uh, I didn't know how I was really going to support them. I knew I had obviously, thank God, or the retirement for, you know, insurance and stuff like that, but it was a big pay cut, but I, it was something that I needed to do. And I didn't have a degree to have like a career. Cause I mean, even today, like it's tough, like even a bachelor's degree is considered like a high school diploma these days. And here I got a big family. I'm like, what am I going to do? I don't have a career enough to take care of, you know, everyone i mean but knowing me like i'm not gonna just settle for mediocrity you know what i'm saying so i was just like well let me get my uh let me get my degree because at the same time while i'm doing that uh we have the gi bill which gives you like a monthly housing allowance which will pay for my rent and stuff like that and a stipend where i can pay for the books and a little extra you know to put you know food on the table so I was like, that, that was perfect. So God bless that. But meanwhile, while I was doing that, it just kind of, I don't know how to really put this because for 14 years of my life, it was spent, majority of it was in Iraq, Afghanistan, Central, South America. So all those years, you know, it's one time I was in Iraq for 15 months. So you leave there and, you know, you come back two years of trends, you know, bands, new wrestlers, promotions, like a lot of stuff happens. You don't know what's going on you know, cause you've been living an isolated life. So for those 14 years, I really don't know what was going on here. So now that I'm out of the military, I kind of feel like I'm just graduating high school. You know what I'm saying? Like all those years, like I'm, I feel like I can kind of live again. Not even though I'm 30 at that time, I was 33. So I still can think, act like, you know, <laughs> I'm a young spring chicken. So I'm like, man, I, that was my chance to get back on the wrestling team because I was on Team USA, obviously, when I was uh, in high school. And I originally got a wrestling scholarship, but I was like, I know I'm too old. But at a minimum, I could be a coach because I have the skill set. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a freaking Green Beret. And that's where I was just like, let me get in the athletic program. Because it was something huge for me growing up in Arizona, poor, you know, Pat Tillman was from here. And he was just kind of very revered. Like, you know, so just to be part of ASU, Arizona State University, was something big for me, especially for a trailer park kid. Coming here, getting into the wrestling program, 
anyway, I didn't care. I'd take out the trash, mop the mats. I just wanted to be, you know, part of, part of the elite, the top 1%. And I basically, you know, met the athletic director, the coaches, and it's kind of got my foot in the door. And from there, it was just like, hey, obviously – we have enough coaches by NCAA record, so we can't do that. But turns out since you were in the military and served those years that you were gone, it froze your eligibility. So really on paper, you're like 19. And I was like, get out of here. So like, yeah, uh, they're like Roman, since you've been here for a while, you've already been working out with the guys, you know, we'll give you a tryout, you know, just like everyone else. And, you know, if you can hang and live the lifestyle, you know, I mean, cause being an NCAA athlete is, a lot, but I, it wasn't anything that I wasn't used to, you know, weight training in the morning, schools, workouts in the afternoon, and still maintain a life. And, you know, I'm in my 30s. I can do it now. And that's kind of how that happened. It, it, it was a long process, a lot of paperwork, and, man, just a lot of proving myself. But lo and behold, man, i become the, uh, the oldest D1 athlete ever. Yeah. And a lot of that was because of Randy Couture, though. Because he he'd already set the precedent because he was 29 when he went back to school after he got out of the Army. So that's what kind of like where the coaches was like, hey, you know, that's where it got him thinking like, well, he was in the Army. He was 29. You're 33, but maybe that applies to you too. And it so happened that it did, you know. Well, you definitely got a lot of eyes on you, and there's been some remarkable stories. Uh, we'll probably put the links up too whenever this interview goes out just so you can see um, your journey and how incredible it was and how everybody was, you know, rooting you on. And, um, you know, it, it sounds like some of your your teammates weren't so sure when you first got in, but um, like <laughs> most everything you do, it seems like you, you proved some people wrong and not in a bad way, but you just kind of showed everybody that you could hang. And um, so, you know, where where do you stand currently with, collegiate wrestling are you are you hanging up the the boots for that and um kind of tell us how you're getting into currently the world of professional wrestling right so um so i made history this year where i finally took the mats and <laughs> uh, became the oldest athlete to or wrestler to compete at a division one level right after that was uh where i was got the invite to the WWE tryout. So by doing so, I had to release my eligibility as far as to compete. Now I'm still on the, you know, the current roster, the wrestling team. I just released my eligibility because that's just how the NCAA works. You can't, you know, within regulations, you can't do other things. I mean, try out for other stuff, even if it's sports entertainment. Um, but that's, so that's what I did. I, I did, I released the eligibility and, obviously stayed with the team and still kind of played just that teammate role. And at the same time, worked these other ventures of training with Dan Severn, um, with, you know, professional rec- wrestling techniques, um, reached out to actually, uh, he's a buddy of mine now, but prior to that, I didn't even know he was an ASU alumni, but he's on the uh, independent scene, Kenny Lester. Uh, he goes by Gorilla Blanco, the heart foundation. So he was, a uh, you know, he was linked with, you know, Teddy and Maria. So I went out there uh, to where he was at, got a little bit of training, you know, with him, Brian Idol, Natalia, like the Russian crush. Like, so basically from there, like I, onesies and twosies to five people, like I was getting one-on-one training for like, you know, two months prior to going to that tryout. It was just because, and it wasn't just because of my story. It's kind of like, here's some old guy coming in to train. Yeah. Let's see what he got. But the thing is, like, if you show me something once or twice, like, I'm going to pick it up. And I'm not just a flash in the pan. Like, this is something that I really want to do. And anything that I set my mind to, like, I'm going to do it not just to the best to get it done once. Like, I look for, like, the long-term deal because that's how things <laughs> – that's how people succeed. Like, you look for something long-term, not just the, the short-term uh, gain, I guess. And so people saw that. At first, they're like, okay, he's training, but then, you know – I'm taking bump after bump after bump and then doing stuff to making it look believable and real. And obviously that, that was part of the fan of me. Like I've been doing that in my head for, for years, <laughs> but just impressing people doing what I could training. And it was just like word would just kind of go to other people and I would get the invite and be able to kind of train. And I did the tryout, came back to Arizona and kind of seeked out some other people. You know, I 
was able to work with a guy named, you know, Roman Alexander, Gabriel Alexander. They gave me my, you know, one of my first matches with, you know, with Dan Severn in my corner. So I was able to continue just training. And then I got linked up with an awesome, you know, pro wrestling uh, school, the Arizona Pro Wrestling Training Center out here in, uh, you know, Mesa, Arizona, you know, trained by Gabriel Gallows and Don Vitale, like the bullies. So it's like, Everywhere I'm, I'm at, I'm surrounded by the elite, the top 1%. And that's where I kind of use that. Like, your character is you, like, ramped up to 100. And I always start off at the bottom, but make my way up to the top. So that's why I kind of use that. Not necessarily cocky, confident deal, but it goes. It's, it's good for the gimmick, but it's also proven. Like, I can prove it. Like, I'm with the elite, the top 1%, the special forces, NCAA, Division One, you know, WWE. And now, you know, every pro wrestler that's training me, like, they're all the best. So it's not like I'm lying, but I'm just kind of elevating it and ramping it up and putting it on steroids and putting it out there to people. Yeah, absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, the world of professional wrestling has seen um, a handful, I'll say, of actual active um, or, you know, non-active wrestlers. military uh with within the the world of professional wrestling so um is that something that you would want to add into your i mean you know we call it a gimmick in in wrestling but is that something that you would want to do or are you looking to be you know something different or would that be something that would definitely play a part in your in your character man i don't know if you can really take it away because i'm like i'm the real deal i'm not scripted like the story and the people that watch the links and the videos and stuff like that, you can't make that up. People can write it for their gimmick in the real pro or in the world of professional wrestling, but I actually lived it. So it's kind of like my character, this crazy life that I lived is actually real. So as far as like a Roman Roselle guy, I mean, it encompasses a bunch of things. You got, you do have a military aspect, both the regular army and the special forces. And you have like the collegiate amateur aspect. You have the poor, trailer park white trash kid you know you got that part you got the dad the husband you know with the kids like there's there's so much uh that i can kind of utilize where i'm you know i don't want to steal lex luger's deal but i'm the total package (laughs) i got a good flavor for anybody you know for for that so i think just kind of getting out there and like i said just ramp up that ramp up me to 100 and i'm gonna connect with somebody now, if you're talking like more like to answer your question of is it like I'm gonna go with the sergeant slaughter role or any of that? No, really, I just gotta be me. Just <laughs> me. I was gonna say me on steroids, but I'm not on steroids. Just like me, but with the attitude, act, gimmick on steroids. So I come out there, and you know, you're probably gonna see some type of military like logo or something like that. You'll see like a shooter style amateur. I don't know, singlet like my gear you'll see all that it, you'll see a lot of ties to everything and you know i don't like to i'm not an ugly guy either you know so you mean you got that there's your ravishing rick rude thing a lot of people there when they go. saw the grunt style promo they're like hey they're like did you did you watch some rick rude stuff i was like no nah, man <laughs> i was like i've been watching my whole life i was like i wasn't going for that but since you put it out there that's a compliment yeah absolutely. so you never know who you're going to connect with but that's kind of like me like i'm just i think i'm just your average guy really and that's kind of like your Daniel Bryan, like people that can relate to him. And yeah. just, I'm that average guy, and I just happen to like carve my own path to some great things. And that's what everybody's trying to do in life. And I think that's where I kind of shine and kind of can resonate with a lot of people. Well, it's really interesting because you've had such a a, a life already. You know, there's been ups, there's been downs. Um, for people that are listening to this right now, you know, you've mentioned that you've had some trauma in your life, whether it be when you were younger or when you were in the service, um, you, you're a father, you're, you're seemingly, you're, you're balancing everything. Um, what would your advice be to anybody that's out there that may be struggling or, um, having some hard times right now? What would you say to them? Like with addiction or anything, or just trying to get to that next step? Just really anything that that you maybe went through that you could tell people, you know, what what your how you got through it. Damn. Well, it's you got to be kind of spiritual for most. How I got through it, I'm a spiritual. 
straight lips. That's how I got through it. But in, in all essence, like aside from that, that'll take you so far. Like you got to put in the work and you have to understand like people are going to quit on you. And uh, this, this is, this is one of those things that's been said so many times before. Yeah. People are going to quit on you. They're going to, there's God, nobody's going to believe in you, but you have to learn to not quit on yourself. I mean, when I first came, God, everywhere that I've been, like I said, I've had to always prove myself. I, it would be nice if I could just walk in the door and people like, God, he's exactly what he says he is, but no, and it takes time. And a lot of the times, like, even when I came to the wrestling program, there was lots of people that didn't want me around or didn't believe it. When I was in special forces, a lot of people didn't believe it. You're not the biggest. You're not the fastest. You don't look like it, but you got to know. I mean, we all know who we are inside, man. And a lot of us, everyone has that potential. And think about how many people who have probably given up just because of some asshole on the side or, you know, some other authority figure that maybe didn't believe in you. And then the person ends up like quitting and going and, washing cars. Not that it's a bad thing, but you know, he could have been the next John Cena, but because somebody else, you know, kind of like shot him down or even with addiction, man, like we're all looking for something to fill like avoid a gap that, you know, someone else has carved out of us. And it's, it's a matter of saying, man, like I just released the t-shirt and this is not just a plug for it, but it says GSD on my t-shirt through ground style. And that just means get shit done. And that is you get shit done without, thinking about anybody else who you may be offending or anything like that because you have to look out for you your best interest that that's all that matters like you can't sit around waiting for someone to come recruit you or do anything like that you got to get shit done you got to get it out there and you got to poke the bear and then come back and you know be willing to sacrifice your body to get beat down torn bruised to freaking bloodied up naked to bear your whole body in order to take down the biggest, nastiest enemy, you know, down the road. And some of that was taken from the ultimate warrior, but that's the truth, man. That's, the, that's how I've lived my life was based off of that stuff. And I, I want other people to do that same thing, man. Get shit done. Get out there. Absolutely. Well, it's super inspiring stuff. And I know that, um, you know, you mentioned it earlier, but grunt style clothing. Um, what can you tell us about that? Man, grunt style is a, you can't walk anywhere in the country. You can't walk 10 feet without seeing somebody in a grunt style t-shirt. And if you're not familiar with grunt style, it has the, you know, the flag, the backwards flag. Cause you're, you know, you're marching toward whatever it's on the right side. And on the left side, some cross rifles and <laughs> just the best designs and shirt apparel, but not just apparel. Everyone thinks it's a military company. It's a patriotic company. It's, they want everyone in this country to be patriotic because we have a lot of crap going on all the time. And people get on these tangents about, you know, the government or this side, political parties, rather than just understanding that we have these freedoms to go accomplish and become an NCAA athlete or become a pro wrestler. Like that, just being a patriot, like you couldn't do this in the Middle East, Central, South America, wherever. I've been there. And so it's just, it's just being a patriot. And with that, like it's everything. You got hunting, fishing. You know, first responders, military, and you got pro wrestling. They love it all. Like, cause that's, that's America, right? And so that's a, that's a clothing brand. And, you know, we got, uh, we're trying to take, take over the wrestling world. I mean, obviously, like, we're pulling gimmicks and stuff. We're not really, like, coming, starting a war, doing the Monday Night Wars or nothing like that. But pro wrestling's big, man. It's big to me. And when we partnered up together, it just so happened that the co-founder was a huge pro wrestling fan himself. So it was just like, man, it was kind of meant to be. And I just happened to have a great story to kind of back it up and still live it and to make, to get shit done, to make shit happen. So, and at the same time, man, we're, there's other pro wrestlers that wear the clothing too. Like you'll, you'll probably start to notice it a little bit more. You know, I know, uh, we're always recruiting. That's what we're doing. We're trying, like I said, we're trying to, we're trying to create a grunt style NWO. I mean, not really, but kind of, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And even if you're not a pro wrestler, like we want you anyways, you know, we want you on the team. Well, we're super. So, ex- that, that, that's, that's what grunt style. Um, he, uh, the co-founder, Tim Jensen, he's a, he, he's the grunt style first sergeant and he plays my manager and he, he's really good. I don't know if you guys have seen the promo, but man, he's, uh, he, he, 
he knows his wrestling. Let's put it that way. I was gonna say it feels very reminiscent of an old an old school promo. It's a it's a really cool thing, and we'll have to like I said put the links out there for everybody to check that out. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's um you know it's New Year and all that stuff. So um what what is your um kind of what is your goal for 2020? What's some of the things that you're looking to do in the world of professional wrestling and um, and also, just for anybody that's out there listening to this, um, how can they keep up with all things Roman Roselle right now? Uh, follow me on Instagram, you know, Twitter, Facebook, mainly those those three uh, outlets at, at Roman Roselle, R O M A N R O Z E L L. Just just follow the link, and hey, no matter like, it seems like I have a bunch of things going on, but at the end of the day, this is my advice to other people too is. You know, the mission first. I set out to, I did a lot of cool things on the side, but getting my degree was still my priority and it still is. So I'm still in school and I'm getting that done. I got to get that done. Everything else that happens, you know, that's just icing on the cake. Uh, I have some some good stuff. I'll be doing some extra work for WWE. Obviously, I'm still, I'm getting trained by the best at, you know, the pro Arizona Pro Wrestling Training Center. You know, I've already had a match, pro wrestling match. So check that out. So, I'm, you know, there's so much more to come. But like I said, I got to graduate first. That's a priority. Graduate in May. So stay tuned to that. And like I said, Grunt Style and myself are taking over the pro wrestling scene. And, you know, recruit and do whatever we can. Like 2020 is going to be big. Not just for, for me, but for everybody. Because it isn't about me. Like I'm coming out here like playing the role and being me but at the same time like I've never been a selfish one with opportunity and I think that's what's lacking with a lot of people man I, like I think we would everybody would be a lot more successful and a lot more happier if we were all kind of helping each other out and trying to get to the next level to where we need to be and some of us have made it to those situations in order to make that happen and so that's what I'm looking at with 2020 man is I've gotten to where I needed to be I'm very comfortable with where I'm at but there's one thing I always say, don't ever get comfortable with being comfortable, get comfortable with being uncomfortable, which means you got to challenge yourself. So I'll be challenging myself. But like I said, I'm me and the partnership that I have, like we want to help other people out. And again, you know, I, I want to be wrestling in a big promotion someday. You know, there's so many awesome, gosh, man, you got the NWA impact, you know, new Japan, the WWE, AEW, I mean, that can give you every three-letter organization. But, I mean, that's the ultimate goal. But at the same time, I got to focus on, you know, step-by-step, brick-by-brick, day-by-day, and get shit done, you know? Absolutely. Well, in in the spirit of what you were just saying, uh, something I wanted to try to do this year for 2020, I know a lot of people out there, uh, especially in the world of wrestling, for whatever reason, they are – kind of um, sometimes they can be negative about the business or this or that or whatever. So one of the things I've been trying to do is to just get the our, our people that come on here, our interviews, to, to say something um, good about something that's happened to them in the world of professional wrestling. So now's your chance. You can shout out somebody who has helped you. You can um, tell a story about something that, um, you know, that, a time when somebody helped you or just something that you like about professional wrestling right now. So, um, just, you know, any kind of thing that's positive as far as the world of wrestling goes, um, I'd like you to take that time and just, uh, to shout something out. Gosh, where do I be- begin, man? I've been truly blessed. I mean, I definitely have some horror stories, but I- I've been blessed by a a lot of people in the pro wrestling industry be, just because of, uh, how do I say this? Like there's what I kind of mentioned earlier. There are people out there, stars that you see on TV right now who really want to help make you not just achieve your dream, but kind of make it a better environment. A lot of people say that the pro wrestling environment and business is toxic and you know, it can be, but they're at the same time. That's anywhere. I mean, you can work at Taco Bell and you're going to have that same environment but for me, man, just with the help, a shout out like Austin Idol, the, you know, the heartthrob Austin Idol, you know, who does the NWA com- or kayfabe cocktails, you know, he's got his school and stuff like that. He was one of the first guys actually to reach out to me 
and help me with the business uh, as far as, you know, making decisions and stuff like that. You know, you got Kenny Lester, Gorilla Blanco. Yeah, I could just go by names, Roman Alexander, you know. Even uh, he goes by Wolfgang. He, uh, he actually co-owns the Arizona Pro Wrestling Training Center and just those guys, you know, helping me out just, man, intensely. And just even the WWE, just all the people bringing me up there and then the feedback afterwards and then just, like, the help and the continued work and just the people I meet. Like, it's kind of hard, man. I can go on for days. And here's here's just the short snapshot. If you follow my Instagram or Facebook, a lot of those guys that I want to give shout-outs to, those are the guys, like, they're on there. So you can be like, hey, who's with him? Who's following him? Who does he follow? Those people are the ones that that are genuine, like, really out there to help me and are just good for the business. They're the best, like Brett had said, the best there is, was, and ever will be. All those guys are. And I hate maybe leaving some people out. Oh, Dan Severn, obviously. I got to give to him. He's my manager. He's my enforcer, man. He's actually He actually was training with me last night. Like, he doesn't stop. Like, he has so much going on, but, again, mentoring me and protecting me. That's the big thing, the protection. And just having these people in my corner. I want to be able to give back to the other people coming up to the way that Dan Severn protects me or, you know, Austin Idol, you know, Kenny Lester, any of those guys, you know, and, or, you know, Dom and Gallows, all these guys protect me and making sure that I'm polishing up my work. Oh, I got to stop myself. Kevin Cassidy, man, gentleman Jervis. This guy has really helped me out too from the start. He's the one that actually put me in a lot of connection with a lot of great wrestlers, WWE, AEW, everywhere to help prepare me for the WWE tryout. And then even after just kind of developing like my promos, my gimmicks. So mad props to him. I forgive me for even not even mentioning him at the beginning. Cause he's been with me pretty much since day one. So, well, we hope that, uh, this isn't the last time that we speak with you. We know that you've got a lot going on and we're super happy yeah. that you came on to talk to us today, but, um, truly an inspiration an inspiring story get out there and watch the videos and uh and check out some of these other interviews that roman roselle's done but um again thank you so much for coming on and uh good luck with everything that you've got going on no i thank you this was an honor honestly another wrestling podcast well thank you again and the uh, the top one percent you heard it you heard it right there the one percent